You are listening to the Lawyer Stories Podcast with host Benny Gold. Lawyer Stories was founded in July 2017 and is an expanding global network of lawyers and law students sharing their personal journeys to the noble profession of the practice of law. Join us on this podcast as we dig deeper into these stories and hear from lawyers and law students from around the world in all areas of the legal profession. Here at Lawyer Stories, we believe that every lawyer has a story. What's yours? Welcome to the Lawyer Stories podcast with Benny Gold. Uh, Today we welcome in Joshua Schwadron, founder and CEO of Mighty, a mission-driven startup uh, reimagining what happens to innocent people after an accident. Thanks for being here, Josh. Thanks so much for having me, Benny. Great, 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 uh, great to chat. Yeah, for sure. No, we're happy to have you on. You're doing some interesting things. Uh, I was reading up on it more. It seems super cool. I think uh, you know we got to get this out to the community and let let them know what's happening. Um, so, congratulations on the launch, first of all. Thank I know you. That so happened. Much. A week or two ago um so like let's just this is lawyer stories so we talk stories so we won't spend too much time on it but just to create like a base just to get going like just tell us where uh, i know you're in new york city miss it very much um i used to live in downtown new haven and take the metro north down nice. to the city but anyway so like where are you born and raised uh miami florida oh beautiful love it love it there that's all right two amazing places um so you went to uh, you went to Michigan undergrad, right? Go blue. Thank you. And uh, Emory Law, two terrific schools. Um, tell us, like, when you knew you wanted to be a lawyer. I think probably from from fairly early on. Um, I was growing up. I was a big West Wing fanatic. Okay. Uh, I was very into politics. I was inspired by uh, people trying to you know make changes in the world and public service. And one of the things I always found really interesting was that whenever I would hear a politician speak, they always, uh, or they often uh, talked offhandedly about how they had a law degree. Okay. Uh, yep. And um, I just found the, the whole idea that our society has rules and that we have to learn how to play within those rules uh, to be an important element of uh, society that I wanted to kind of learn more about and be able to, um, you know, gain an expertise in. So I think that was really the kind of initial inspiration. Um, I also, uh, just to kind of show a little bit of my Sorkin bias, uh, I was also inspired early on by a few good men. Okay. Uh, And so, uh, there's probably some, uh, some Tom Cruise, uh, action that I, uh, that I've always, always enjoyed. There you go. All right. Why not? Who doesn't like uh, some good Tom Cruise action? Um, so there was law school, but tell you have an entrepreneurial spirit. You know, I was like looking uh, over some of your bio. So like, when did you know you were sort of an entrepreneur? Yeah, so uh, I think as I got into law school and I heard about many of my classmates and what they hoped their path would be, which was often to go into big law, I couldn't imagine uh, kind of spending my, my, my time at like a big law firm and, uh, and working on, uh, kind of some, a lot of mundane transactions for other people. So I think from the, from the very early, very early on in law school, I realized that for me, law would be a great foundation that potentially it would help pay the bills for a while, but that, uh, it was probably not something where I was going to be, you know, I was going to call myself a lawyer for the rest of my career. And in fact, the internships I had during uh, law school, I had one an investment bank, I had another working in a political campaign. Uh, And so it was not the traditional track uh, that law students usually take. Gotcha. Yeah, no, it's, I totally get that. Um, So like, how can a person tell if they're an entrepreneur, would you say? Like, there are a lot of people out there, I feel like, who self-proclaim, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm an entrepreneur, especially in like this day and age of the internet. And social media, like how, how does somebody truly know if like that's what they are? Yeah, it's a great question. I think there's a few different levels to it. I think number one, I think it has a lot to do with, uh, well, I think there's obviously various types of entrepreneurs. Um, I, I, I am kind of what I, what I think of as a tech entrepreneur uh, where I'm, I'm big into innovation. 
And the way I see the world is from first principles, which essentially means that almost everything I experience, I ask the question, why, why, is, why does this exist? And why does this operate in this way? And if, the, if we had to create this system from scratch, how would it look? And I've done that my whole life. And I've always tried to take contrarian views. I've always tried to reimagine um, how and why things work the way they do. Uh, and I think that is often a common uh, personality trait in a lot of people who get into kind of second innovation uh, okay. or early, early on. Wow, that's, yeah, I can tell. It's, uh, you're, you're really, uh, you know, you think differently. I could tell you're like a really smart dude. Um, okay, so what, going back to law school, like just tell us briefly, like what was your law school experience like? I had, a, I had a great law school experience. Okay. Um, I really enjoyed law school. Uh, I, I, when I, I became the, uh, I was elected the public or the defender, the whatever they call it, the, the prosecutor uh, for the honor court. Uh, wow. And I, I really enjoyed uh, that role. Uh, I loved Atlanta uh, and I loved everything about the city and the culture. Um, I ended up graduating law school a semester early um, in order to explore um, some kind of business opportunities, which was also um, a really kind of cool thing I was able to, to do. Um, and overall, I had a really positive experience um, yeah. at, at Emory. That's amazing. So um, do you remember what your first job at a law school was like? Yeah, I actually, you know, my first job at law school was actually very formative uh, in actually what we're doing today. So my first job at a law school was working for a hedge fund. And wow. coinc coincidentally, one of the trades that the hedge fund engaged in was they financed personal injury law lawyers. Yeah. And I really found it fascinating at the time because number one, I had studied business in undergrad and I got my master's degree at, a, at, a business, at, a, at, a, at a, my accounting master's degree at Michigan. Um, and then I went to law school. But until that job, I had never really realized that there was like basically this litigation finance, which, you know, 15 or 20 years ago when I had that job, that term hadn't really been invented yet. Um, but there's this idea of litigation finance where lit legal cases have value, their assets, and you can finance right. them. That's and what I found even more interesting was that personal injury lawyers, they kind of talk about how the their clients can't afford their services and that what they're what they have to do instead is take contingency interests from their clients because the clients don't have money up front um, and the lawyers you know implicitly can afford to take these contingency interests and wait for the cases to settle but that's that's a misnomer uh, a huge percentage of personal injury firms get financing themselves and so they actually can't wait either. Uh, they have to pay for rent. They have to pay for more advertising. They have to pay for paralegals. They have to pay for case expenses and right. they need to finance as well. And so it's just, it always struck me as really interesting that the, 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 the person who's injured gives an interest in the case to the lawyer, but then the lawyer gives an interest in the case to a financier, uh, which is actually the first job I had of college. And that was really formative in understanding all of the different economic um, and, and other kind of systems in the personal injury space. Okay, so tell us how you came up with the idea of Mighty. Is that sort of how? I mean, just go ahead. So Mighty, I wouldn't say is a singular idea, but right. instead I would say is a singular, we've had a singular mission from day one. Right. And that singular mission was just to help injured people after accidents um, and one of the things that we recognized uh, very early on was that the people who cause accidents, who are represented by Allstate and State Farm and Geico, they often have it a lot better than the people who are innocent, who have to go and hire a personal injury lawyer. Right. I always found that, 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 that fascinating. And I really uh, saw firsthand through a number of experiences I had that people who are injured, who are innocent, end up getting a really bad deal from the justice system. They have to wait a long time. Uh, their lawyers are often have different incentives than they do. Uh, they only get a small percentage of their settlement. It takes a really, really, right. really long time. And 
I wanted to start a company that helped change that. And frankly, I've been working on this problem now as mighty for seven years. So it's really been a slog. And I've made so many mistakes, like so many entrepreneurs before me have. But one of the things that remains unchanged throughout is our mission, which is again, to help these injured people. And what, what happened two weeks ago was in a lot of ways, the culmination of that seven years, which is we launched a consumer brand that squarely competes with traditional personal injury lawyers and really challenges them to rethink how they price. All personal injury lawyers charge, uh, sorry, personal injury lawyers generally charge somewhere between 33 and 40%. Um, it, re it helps them rethink the services that they offer. Mm -hmm. uh, usually they're only offering legal services or things that help raise the settlement value. It challenges them to rethink transparency and alignment. Um, and so we're super excited about uh, the launch of this and uh, with it, uh, Mighty Law, um, which is a law firm uh, that we are affiliated with, but have no common ownership between uh, their law firm and, and our company. Yeah, there's, and there's so much to go into that. I read your blog on, your, uh, on Mighty from, I think it was June 22nd on the Mighty webpage, super interesting. You put a lot of thought into it. So, but why would you pick a fight with like, these established personal injury billboard lawyers, as you call them. Yeah, it's scary. I mean, these people have tons of power. Uh, the plaintiff's bar is kind of not to be messed with. Um, but one of the things we saw was that nothing has changed in decades. And injured people deserve better than an anti-competitive market that uh, doesn't compete on price, uh, barely competes on the kind of service level and, and depth, uh, has very little transparency. If you look at almost any personal injury website, you can't find, for example, the price of the basic legal service. Yep. Um, and so uh, we wanted to challenge the industry to move forward faster. And often the best way of doing that is being that like stalking horse. And that's very much uh, a position that we've embraced and will continue to embrace. Yeah, so would you say this happens in all states? Like, are, is Mighty gonna be something that you wanna spread out to different states? I know you have it in a few states right now, but I feel like verdicts and settlements are bigger in some states like that I've seen uh, than other states. So does that play a role in everything? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly the the every each of the fifty states is is different, and we are trying to build a national brand. Uh, we are not launched nationally uh, yet. We're only in three states. We're in Texas, Connecticut, and Georgia. Right. Um, but we think that there are opportunities in all states to affect positive change for people who are injured, and that's really what our mission is and that's what we're seeking to do. So again, going back and, and this, you really go back to how you were saying you like to see things from the beginning and like the ground up and like challenge things that way. And that's totally what, what this is. So what, like, how is it that attorneys um, get to refer their client, get to refer clients to certain doctors? Like, isn't that the insurance company? Like, you know, and, and also what's a chop shop? Like I read about that, like in your, in your blog. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So one of the really uh, challenging things about uh, what happens to people after an accident um, is they often don't have insurance. Maybe they do have insurance, but their deductible is high. Um, or maybe uh, they're in a state that's kind of wonky with respect to how um, insurance works with um, people who are injured. And there's a big phenomenon that is all across America that many kind of lay people don't understand or have heard of, which yep. is there are doctors who take uh, not insurance uh, as payment, not Medicare and Medicaid as payment, not cash as payment. They literally take a financial interest in a personal injury case, just like the lawyer does, which is- and, a, which and is just to stop, yeah. 
And just to stop right there, go contingency ahead. doctors, which is effectively what that is. So sorry to interrupt. No, contingency doctors. Yeah, I read that. And it's interesting because this is something that I really haven't come across a lot. I mean, I've had a lot of personal injuries attorneys on the show, and it's really interesting to hear about um, doctors being able to take an interest in a case like you wouldn't think that that was uh like an ethical type of thing i mean maybe it's not i don't really know what the yeah so 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 it is it is it is uh, okay there's nothing kind of implicitly wrong with it i'll I'll also just defend the practice in in theory it's not a bad thing just like contingency lawyers is actually not a bad thing at all uh contingency doctors is also not a bad thing the the reality is that Oftentimes the way the system works today, when someone gets injured and they need medical treatment and they don't have money up front, uh, they need to figure out a way to pay for medical treatment and for legal services for that matter. And contingency itself is a powerful access to justice vehicle, no matter its form. The problem is a little bit more nuanced where it's not contingency that's bad, it's often the applications that are bad. And when doctors um, feel beholden to the lawyer's referrals, yep. uh, they often will uh, acquiesce to their demands because the, the referrals are a lifeline for their business. So that's the motivation of the doctor is to get more cases from the lawyer. Right, right. No, that's, that's, I feel like there needs to be something really written about that. Cause that's, that's really, uh, yeah, that's really interesting. Can you give us like a hypothetical? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Josh. And so just to complete the thought, yep. the, 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 the lawyer, the lawyer then, um, they get paid on gross settlement. So that means that uh, the, they make a percentage generally of the total amount the case settles for, and they have an interest, an incentive, the lawyer does, uh, to increase that settlement as much as possible. Now, one way to increase the settlement is for the client to have more aggressive treatment. Right. So right. There, there are doctors who are known uh, to treat uh, agnostically. They, they send some clients to physical therapy, they send some clients to surgery. Um, and there are other doctors who are known to always recommend surgery. Okay. Um, and so there's a term in personal injury that has become a colloquialism, which is a chop shop. Chop shop. Which is denoting a, a surgery center that tends to treat uh, through chopping uh, people up through surgery, yeah, yeah. much, much more uh, prevalently than um, through physical therapy. And obviously, that's bad for the client, not only because they're often getting unnecessary treatment, but they actually have to pay a larger medical bill at the end of their case. So the benefit of the higher settlement doesn't even always go to them. Um, because they get paid on the net settlement, not the gross settlement. Right. That's right. So if there was a hypothetical, can you take us through like a hypothetical, like if somebody's in a, like what Mighty is going to do for someone, like say somebody's in a car accident. Um, so just like maybe a, a simple brief hypothetical of like how Mighty operates. Yeah, it's great. So before we even go there, it's important to know that Mighty is uh, two entities. Um, Mighty is the company that I am uh, the founder and CEO of. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's another company called Mighty Law, which is a law firm that is owned by the lawyers who work there. And I don't have an interest in Mighty Law and Mighty Law does not have an interest in us. Okay. Um, And so we are actually a service provider uh, to Mighty Law. Uh, And and so uh, somebody gets injured Um, and they will contact Mighty Law and uh, Mighty Law will intake them just like any other law firm. They will ask them about their problems. They'll uh, see if they have a case um, and they will decide whether or not to accept the case, just like any other law firm. But here's here's where things get different. Every other law firm asks their client to sign a contingency agreement 
that has certain things in it and certain things completely excluded. Mighty law lawyers um, have uh, all agreed to a code of conduct, which is 13 uh, unprecedented codes that better align the incentives of mighty law lawyers with their clients than any law firm, any traditional personal injury law firm does today. It's amazing. So what the client can expect when they're signing the contingency agreement with Mighty Law is they'll get things like, you know how every personal injury lawyer says free consultation? Right. At Mighty, uh, Mighty Law gives 60 days of free legal services and people can leave uh, when, when they want because Mighty Law lawyers want people to feel comfortable trying the actual service. Right. Being able to leave. Um, the standard legal fee uh, that people pay Mighty Law is uh, 10% lower than industry standard. And on top of that, we do something uh, that is very different uh, than anything that exists today, which is that Mighty Law actually will give back 10% of the costs of medical treatment that is paid on lien or letter of protection, case costs, financing costs, back to the client at the end of the case. And what that does is it aligns the incentives of the lawyer with that of their client, because now the lawyer makes more money if they're getting their client uh, less expensive financing, where they're, so they're, the lawyer will have to actually actively think about, um, are the expenses that we're incurring on this case actually in the best interest of the client? In this case, their interests are the same as the client because they'll actually have to bear some of that cost. Wow, no, that's amazing. Um, and you have attorneys that are willing to do the same type of personal injury work, but abide by these 13 uh, rules that you that you have. Yeah, that's right. And a huge, yeah. a, huge and a huge list of people who want to do it, but you know, uh, you know, we're not yet kind of at the scale uh, where, where we're ready for them. Yeah, I think one of the that's things, awesome. One of the things I found in law school was that in law school, people, I know, which I, I know is a lot of what your, your show focuses on. In law school, there's like an idealism about, amongst lawyers that in law, you'll be able to kind of do well by doing good. And there, it, re reality sets in, in in law. And one of, you know, and often what happens is you find yourself only doing good by doing pro bono work. Right. right. That's interesting. And, yeah, it's true. And so we really think that a lot of the people who are affected by personal injuries are the same sorts of people who typically seek out legal aid. Uh, they often are from underrepresented or marginalized communities. And there's a really powerful, um, there's a really powerful uh, opportunity for lawyers to help them get uh, justice. Oh, I love that. Amazing. Um, so like, what do you think the general public thinks of uh, personal injury attorneys? When they see a PI attorney, like, uh, you know, we all see the ads, we all see the billboards, we all see the TV commercials, we all hear them on the radio. What do they think? So we, we actually, we have a fairly good idea of what they think. We talk to a lot of people, we ask them what they think. It's actually really fascinating. Um, first, I think a lot of people who, there are a lot of people who like that persona. Um, one of the most interesting comments I've heard is somebody say that they think of personal injury lawyers as sharks, but they want a shark on their side. Um, and yeah. and that, that that makes some sense. I think that that's wrong. And that's not what I would. <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody. <laughs> um, but I can see how that uh, idea kind of yeah. makes the way to the mainstream. I think a lot of the intellectual class the people on Twitter, the people I went to law school with, um, they, think, they think poorly of personal injury. Um, right. And uh, I think that uh, it is often looked down upon um, in, in the kind of, um, again, like intellectual class. Uh, so it's an interesting juxtaposition. Gotcha. Uh, okay, well, that was put very nicely. Um, so... Give me, give me just some general advice. You're and you have an entrepreneurial spirit, uh, spirit, very smart guy. Um, give us some advice for an entrepreneur just starting out. 
with yeah. a new idea. Advice for an entrepreneur just starting out with a new idea. Um, number one, don't be scared to share your idea with anyone who will listen. Your idea is not proprietary. Your idea is not uh, original or, or, or unique. And if you tell a million people, no one will steal your idea. So don't worry about any of that. That is the first and most important piece of advice because there's often a general unwillingness to share your ideas with others, which is actually the most important first step, which is getting feedback okay. um, and going to the market. Um, almost all great ideas, or rather almost all great businesses did not start either with the exact idea that the person first thought of, or often and usually even close to the idea that people first thought of. And so the key to being a successful entrepreneur um, or, you know, in some people's cases, an unsuccessful entrepreneur yeah. well, um, is, is just to be iter iterative and to take feedback and to, okay. um, and to learn and to evolve. Uh, I think that would be my, my number one piece of advice. Like um, I think, uh, yeah, I think talking to, talking to your customers and, and sharing your ideas. I like it. So why should, um, somebody who's just been injured come to mighty rather than like a billboard attorney? Yeah, so I think the the most the most important. So I think there's there's two different answers I can give you. Sure. One is the answer I would give to the actual injured person, and I would tell them you want to come to Mighty because number one, it'll be lower lower cost. Uh, number two, you'll get a far larger suite of services. Uh, not only will you get legal services, but you'll get help finding and paying for medical providers. Uh, helping to get financing if you need to bridge the financial gap between the time you get injured and the time your case settles. Uh, you'll be, have uh, a very transparent uh, uh, and, and, um, and attentive team working with you throughout the entire process. Um, and so I think that the pitch for them is around like actually the, the services and the price of the services that, that, that they're getting. If I was talking to a, lawyer, a fellow lawyer like you, um, and you were thinking about like, how, what should I tell my, 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 my cousin who was just in an accident? Um, I would describe to you in, instead, the reason people should go to Mighty is because our incentives are better aligned with our clients than personal injury lawyers. And there's a famous Charlie Munger quote, uh, who's Warren Buffett's business partner for a, a gazillion years, um, which is that if you show me the incentive um, I'll show you the the action, or I'll show you what people are actually going to do. And okay. I, I believe wholeheartedly in that. People follow their incentives. And the sen incentives of personal injury lawyers today are out of whack and misaligned with that of their clients. Everything from how they um, how they charge to the services they provide to the level of transparency that's required. Right, right. Mighty has rewired those incentives to make them far, far more aligned with the client themselves. Gotcha. Um, so Josh, where do you see Mighty in the next five to 10 years? One of the biggest disappointments of personal injury in the last, in the decades uh, that, have, uh, that have passed us is there's just been no innovation in personal injury. Interesting. And, and um, we want to continue to innovate. So we've already brought the most innovative model to the, to the market that we've seen in, in decades. Um, and it would be easy for us to kind of rest on our laurels and just to kind of say, we're here and let's just grow. Um, and we obviously have a big plan to grow and to move to all 50 states. But one of our big goals is also to keep on innovating and pushing. And we want to increase the services and the service quality even more. We want to decrease price even more. We want to increase transparency even more. Right. And we think that that mentality is so different than what exists in personal injury today. And so we, we see ourselves um, evolving rapidly in the years to come. And, uh, and five years from now, when you know half the cars are self-driving cars and yes, seriously. Um, every, every accident has like an instantaneous report about what happened, um, you know, we hope to be on the forefront of that too. Yeah, no, totally makes sense. Um, give us some advice for someone who is uh, pursuing something that's a little bit different, 
sort of like you are, like um, sort of going up against the norm? Like, do you have advice uh, for someone or a company who's trying to to do that as well? Yeah, I think I think um, number one, the advice is to surround yourself with people who are open to new ideas, um, even if they don't agree with them. So I think contrarians, which is I think largely what you're describing, um, they're they're unique. And it's not common to like be able to surround yourself with fellow contrarians amongst you. Um, But you do want to surround yourself with people who are open-minded, who are willing to change uh, their opinions um, and who are thoughtful. And so I think number one is like, who who, who do you surround yourself with uh, first and foremost? Um, I think the other thing is a writing culture is really valuable. And so if people have ideas about uh, contrarian views, I would challenge them to actually write them down concisely and explain in as few words as possible why they think the rest of the world is wrong and what their insight is. Um, There's a a famous book uh, by Peter Thiel, Zero to One, um, and he talks about uh, how everybody has, great companies have a secret. Um, and so what is the secret that you as a contrarian know that you don't think anybody else knows? Um, and if they can write that down and challenge themselves to really do it in as few words as possible, um, that's also a really great forcing function uh, for people. Love it. Uh, is there anything else that we left out today, Josh, that you want to share with the Lawyer Stories community? Um, when you think of the lawyer stories community, wh- 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 where do you, what do you think the biggest demographic is that will help me know what to say? Like, wh- like uh, are they primarily made up of like recent law grads? Are they like? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's kind of all over the place. We got a lot of recent law grads. We have a lot of attorneys. Um, you know, we have them in Florida, New York, uh, California. I know that doesn't really matter the demographic, but it's all it's sort of all over the place. So. Yeah. So, so, so I, I, would, I would just challenge everybody who's listening to this to think of their law degree and their law background um, as uh, giving them a, a huge spectrum of opportunities uh, to work on problems that matter. And law is so intricately involved in every aspect of life and society and policy that law becomes this like this this thread through everything and if people think of law not necessarily as like the practice of law of like helping other people um, but instead trying to make society work better and fairer um, I think it will open everyone's minds up to law related jobs that are very different than just working in a law firm yeah, I like that. And I think a lot of people need to hear that. So, you know, thanks very much for uh, sharing that with us. Uh, is there anything else that we missed today that you'd like to share about Mighty? Um, no, I'm excited to, you know, really be um, providing uh, a great service to people after an accident. Um, you know, I guess the, the shameless plug is if people know uh, uh, friends or family, um, that are injured in Georgia or Connecticut or Texas, and they feel uneasy about the idea of them calling a billboard lawyer, um, we'd love to help them and talk to them. And as I mentioned to you earlier, every law firm is like, oh, no commitment. But then they call, uh, you call a personal injury law firm and like all they care about is like convert, convert, convert. Right. That mighty converting for us simply means starting your multi-month period where you can still leave at any time with no and and so we want to really make it a low pressure environment where people can um you know see if see if it it makes sense for them and and help move forward with their with their case and their injury that's awesome well josh Schwadron, thank you so much uh, for being here today Uh, we really appreciate you sharing uh, the awesome things that you're doing with mighty And, uh, you know, we look forward to, like, checking back in and and seeing what's going on and, you know, how far it's gone. Thanks so much, Benny. It was great, great chatting with you. 
You got it. Stay right there wherever you are in the world today, everybody. Enjoy yourselves. <laughs>